uh, we get going. Uh, my seminar today is about the uh, BTH AI uh, StarCraft bots uh, I've been working on for uh, about a year now and uh, I've participated in uh, this year's uh, two competitions as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we, what I wanted to do with, uh, with the bot and uh, the goals and aims and requirements and stuff we had and, and how we were able to fulfill them when we implemented the system. So basically we, we think that uh, RTS games is a very interesting uh, test bed for both uh, teaching game AI and uh, researching game AI due to uh, complexity and real-time constraints and, and stuff. But it's also extremely time consuming to uh, develop such bots. So we wanted to create a bot architecture that can be modified and expanded uh, so we can do future research and also use it in uh, education for uh, master thesis students, for example. So that's the main goal of, of the system. So to, <coughs> to fulfill this, uh, we defined a number of uh, requirements that we wanted uh, on the system. Um, Play all free races uh, was one, one of them, uh, which uh, is not as easy as it sounds because they behave quite uh, differently, especially Zerg, but have uh, lots of special ways in how they, uh, they don't build, they morph from eggs and, and stuff. <coughs> we also wanted to be able to play on a majority of the StarCraft maps available, uh, and uh, currently the only problem we have if you have a map uh, that is completely island based so you need transports to go between the bases that is not uh, supported at the moment. And of course we wanted to separate as much as possible uh, between the low level and high level tactics. Uh, the goal was to be able to modify the system at different levels without uh, breaking the whole logic. We also wanted that the basic functions like yeah, move, attack, and train a unit, uh, that should just work even if we put into an, in a new unit into the system. Uh, such basic functions should work without uh, any modifications of the code. Uh, but we also wanted to be able to write specific code to micromanage uh, units and different buildings and stuff. Grouping units in squads is also one of the uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we wanted to have uh, squads with different uh, goals and uh, different logic and to be able to, to do certain tasks in the system. And uh, of course we wanted to have uh, different tactics for each player-opponent combination. So if you play Protoss you can if you want to have a different tactics, if you play versus Zerg or if you play versus Terran and, and stuff. So what we came up with was uh, this high-level architecture. I will uh, explain uh, one of them, each module at a time. Uh, it's three basic modules. It's the agents, uh, the managers, and the combat managers. So we will start with uh, the agents down here, which so, <coughs> uh, we choose to use an inheritance tree for, uh, for the agents for, for a number of reasons. Uh, so, uh, we needed a base agent class. It's an abstract class that all agents, regardless of if it's a moving unit, if it's a building, or if it's a worker, uh, use this class as a base class. So, we can put in some global parameters that everyone use, such as unit ID, goal, etc. Uh, even if buildings doesn't really belong to a squad and, and have a goal, uh, we put it in here because it makes it easier to, uh, to call certain functions to get goal and so on. You don't need to typecast everything. And we also have some basic decision support methods. Uh, like checking if an agent is under attack or if it's damaged and stuff and we can take decisions about doing certain actions to help them. 
structure agent is uh, the base agent class for our buildings, and it's extending the, uh, the base agent class. So this agent can do all the basic tasks for a structure. Uh, it can train units, research technologies, build upgrades. And uh, that's most of the buildings only need to do this uh, basic task. So most buildings are of this agent type. Wrong direction. There you go. A unit agent is uh, the base agent for all mobile units except uh, workers. So all uh, offensive and defensive units is the type of unit agent. And this basic agent can uh, do a task like move, attack, and defend. Just basic tasks. Uh, they cannot use any special abilities. There are no code for special abilities in this class. And it also contains a lot of decision support methods, uh, like checking how many friendly units we have within an area, how many enemy ground units, enemy air units, and so on. You can never have uh, too many decision support methods. So there are lots and lots of them to, to use when taking decisions at a different level. And uh, very few uh, units in StarCraft uh, are completely lacking uh, special abilities. Most units have some form of special abilities to use. So uh, this unit, there are not many instances of a unit agent available in the game. Worker agent handles all workers uh, with uh, the task like uh, minerals, gas, uh, constructing buildings, repairing buildings if it's a Terran, and so on. So it's uh, basically a finite state machines where the uh, default state is gathering minerals. So if it doesn't have anything else to do, it's just gather minerals. That's the question. Yeah. So concerning yeah. the worker agents, um, it's possible to attack with workers also. And, and sometimes human players do that. So do you have taken that into account somehow? Or, or is it completely impossible for your bot? Uh, you can attack with uh, workers, yes. You can also assign workers to to squads, you can assign a Terran SCV to follow a squad to repair siege tanks and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the uh, one of the uh, difficulties with attacking with uh, workers is, of course, uh, in the beginning of the game, uh, where people can, uh, the opponent can move your workers away from your own base and uh, and kill them off. So you have to mm -hmm. be a bit careful that workers doesn't run over the whole map. Yeah, sure, but it's, it's some kind of rush strategy. Uh, for example, for Protoss, I saw that often that Protoss do that, uh, try to uh, overrun with, with their own um, uh, probes, overrun your workers, and, and then they basically win the game, I mean, because you don't have any military units. Yeah, that's a, a problem right now, and I think that's a weakness of what have a, I think as a max of attacking with uh, free workers. Unless you place workers in a squad, and of course the whole squad can attack. But if it's just uh, ordinary workers, just three of them attacks at the same time, because we don't want uh, every worker to run out of a base and attack the enemy. Uh, but that could uh, probably be handled in a more in a better way, because one of the, the weaknesses our bots have is uh, it's quite vulnerable in the early game. Mm. So what if the, if the enemy plays such a strategy, comes up with all his workers and tries to, tries to kill yours, what, what does the bot do then? Or does it recognize the situation? Or? Yeah, three of, uh, of my workers will attack back and the rest oh, okay. uh, will do what we uh, okay. are assigned to do. Gather minerals, build buildings and so on. Of course, uh, it's an easy change to make all workers attack, but uh, that doesn't always help. Yeah, sure. And did you implement uh, the cancelling of construction? Uh, so it's, let's assume you build a construction with a dirt, and uh, the worker zone is gone because you uh, place the building, and then the enemy attacks, 
this new building and you see, okay, I will lose if, uh, this building, I, I will lose this building uh, if I know, do not cancel it. Uh, will the bot cancel this building? No, it just tries to uh, continue building it until it is destroyed. And if it's destroyed, uh, he will plan the building again, so we will build it at another time. So it puts it into a building queue. But it tries to finish all buildings. And uh, SVs can also repair buildings. OK, we continue. Uh, if we have a, a structure with uh, some form of special ability, special logic, uh, we can create a, an agent just for that specific building. Uh, for example, refineries uh, have a special agent that uh, assigns three workers to each uh, refinery building. And uh, if one worker is destroyed, you try to find a new one. So it always keeps three workers gathering gas. And the banker agent uh, loads uh, marines into bankers and uh, can also use the Stimpak trick. Uh, uh, marines or firebats cannot use Stimpak ability while in a bunker. Uh, so uh, they need to exit the bunker, use the steam pack ability, and then enter a bunker again. And they have uh, double fire speed uh, during a short duration. So they basically become stronger, but they need to exit the building and enter again to, to use it. So that's some tricks that are implemented. But it's quite rare in the system that uh, a building has its own uh, agent implementation. Uh, the difference is, uh, of course, units. Most units have some form of uh, special abilities, and most units also have a special class on their own uh, that extends the uh, unit agent. So uh, marine agents, they can use the steam packs. Raves can use cloaking field and siege tanks, of course, siege mode. So uh, you can write uh, logic in, e in each of these agents to to enable special abilities, you can also use uh, a targeting agent that's just been uh, implemented uh, that you can choose uh, targets in a more uh, efficient way than uh, the built-in targeting and so on. So, But if you don't have uh, an implementation of a specific unit, it uses the unit agent and uh, you can do all the basic tasks, moving, attacking, defending, and so on. And uh, the agent manager is uh, the container class that handles all agents. So you can add new agents, remove destroyed agents, and uh, also lots of decision support methods to calculate the number of workers we have, a number of units of a specific type, a number of factories, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, basically, the agent manager has the decision support methods that are about our own units, and the unit agents have the uh, decision support methods regarding enemy units. So each update loop of a system, uh, the agent manager calls uh, an update in each of the uh, agent objects, uh, and they take their decisions about what to do. So we think one of the strengths with using this inheritance system is that you, you can go in and modify the logic for for each uni, unit or building in a separate class. You know where the code is for the marines. You just go to the marine agents, you know where the code is for raves and so on. And uh, instead of just having one agent class that tries to handle all logic for all units, you can also add and remove basically what you want. Uh, if you want a special implementation of a building or another unit, you just put it in and everything works. So that was about the uh, agents. So if we don't have any questions right now, I'm going to go into a manager bit. A manager is what we call a, a global agent, so we only have one instance of that agent in the system. <coughs> And that agent can be accessed by all classes and all agents in the system. So uh, we implemented them as uh, singletons. So you can ask the class for an instance of a class and, and use methods on it. So singletons is extremely handy for this kind of uh, behavior. 
So we talked a bit about the agent manager, which is the container for all agents, and it also uses the uh, an agent factory, the factory pattern to uh, create the agents. So uh, the definition of this uh, pattern is to create objects without specifying the exact class of objects. So you just uh, send in a unit from the Broadwar API into the create agents. Uh, method and uh, you get an instance of a base agent back <coughs> and it checks if you send in a marine uh, it checks is there an implementation of marine agent if that one is found it returns an instance of that if you didn't find an implementation of marine agent it returns an instance of unit agent and so on so uh, if we add or remove agent classes and so on we know that we just need to go into the agent factory to modify that logic so we don't spread that logic out in the whole system about how to create the units. <laughs> the exploration manager is the uh, exploring the game world, see where are the enemies and, and so on. Uh, as default you can only get static information about the map so you know where uh, the different start areas are, you know where uh, islands and impossible terrain is and, and so on, but you don't know anything about the opponent, you just know that he, he starts on one of the uh, start locations that are available on the map. If it's just a two-player map you know that he's on the, the other side, if it's a four-player map you don't know where he is. So you need some form of ex Loring to do, and uh, we use a very simple system that are uh, very efficient and uh, works quite well, even if it's not perfect. So the whole uh, <coughs> game area is uh, uh, divided into regions, which uh, I, uh, which is the green areas here. And uh, currently we have an explorer in the uh, region that I marked with the green arrow. Uh, so uh, the numbers in the middle is the frame number that uh, this region was last visited by a known unit. So if we have the uh, explorer in this region, it's updated to the current frame, which we can think is 2475. And we also have another owned unit in another region uh, marked now, which is 2475. So these regions are the ones that are uh, currently visible. And uh, for each update loop for the uh, explorers, uh, we check uh, all the connected regions and uh, pick the one with uh, the lowest value, which is the one that it was uh, longest time since we uh, visited. And uh, currently the explorer will choose this one. And uh, we keep going, updating. Now uh, we are on frame 2500 and uh, this one is updated and also this one because here we have our own unit. And we look at the uh, connecting regions and decide that this is the next way to, to move. And we continue like that going forward and uh, now our uh, own unit standing here decides to go to this area and uh, of course in the next update this is the region that is currently visited by our own unit and the explorer decides to go to this region. So it just moves around the map and choosing the regions and um, of course there is a possibility of getting stuck in uh, in Optimus so uh, the explorer doesn't really do anything useful but uh, in practice uh, the explorer units uh, get shot down before they uh, go into some uh, strange behavior so so it works well even if it's a very simple system uh, you don't have you to always... just, just a question Johan. do you always use just one unit for exploration or many units and does the scheme also work well with many units or yeah it works pretty well with uh, many units as well <coughs> yeah you can have uh, as many units as you want as as explorers and each unit will uh, do this uh, check of the, uh, the regions to, to visit uh, on their own. So if you have two units standing at uh, at this point, one unit decides to, to go to this area, and the other units know that, okay, you are going there, so I need to go somewhere else. So he goes to that area. 
so the uh, the numbers and the regions here is uh, global, uh, but each uh, explorer unit uh, can choose on their own where to go. So they spread out pretty well. Uh, one of the uh, does your system depend on the knowledge uh, which race uh, the enemy plays, uh, or can you also play against random players? I don't get that question. Can you repeat it, please? Um, is, is it possible to play against random enemies from yeah. which you yeah. do not know the race? So this information is updated once you explore the enemy base and know which race the enemy plays? Uh, in theory, it is possible uh, that uh, I can play against a random race, but in the uh, Broad War API, uh, you always get the race, uh, the opponent race. So you always know that, which uh, is kind of a drawback, uh, a bit of cheating from the bots. But of course, I can ignore that and play on a general strategy and update that when I uh, see who the enemy is. And is it also implemented that uh, the, when the enemy plays two uh, races at once? Currently, uh, I only look at one-on-one uh, -on -one games uh, when it comes no, to no, selecting no, no. the tactics. I, I mean, one player can two can can play two races at once. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I think when a Protoss is able to convince another worker unit, and then you can uh, um, build a second base. Ah, yeah, yeah. And, and then you can play case, and yeah. then you can play two races at once. Yeah, that's one. That's one of the exceptions. If you use uh, the mind control of uh, dark archons and uh, take yeah. control over an enemy base, that is currently not implemented. Oh, okay. uh, that is extremely rare that you can get a Protoss uh, dark archon into an enemy base and take control over it. Um, so uh, I haven't really bothered with uh, implementing that, but that's a possibility. By the way, Johan, just an interface uh, question. Uh, we see the chat window here, and, and from time to time somebody is typing, but I don't see what people are typing. Do you see that? or? No, I think they uh, just uh, put a marker in it, uh, but they don't really type anything. Oh, okay. Just select the uh, chat box. So online people, please, uh, you, you can type into the chat box if you want. Yeah. If you have questions. Just ask questions in the chat if you have anything. Uh, we also keep uh, track of all the uh, spotted enemy buildings so we know where uh, the enemy is and try to gather some information about what he's doing. Uh, currently we don't use that information much but we have uh, a statistic implementation that uh, gathers uh, statistical data about the enemy, what kind of buildings he has, what kind of units he has and so on. But uh, one of the difficulties is to, to get accurate uh, data about the enemy before our uh, explorers are killed. So we can actually use that data for something useful. But if you would have perfect information, uh, it could be a bit, uh, you could actually use the data in, a, in another way. But that's a bit of cheating. So, the uh, build planner is uh, the manager that just contains the, uh, the build order. So, uh, what unit, what buildings to construct and in which order. So, it always constructs the first building in the list. So, it assigns a worker uh, that is free to create buildings. A free worker is someone that is currently just gathering minerals. We just pick one of the closest worker and uh, use him. And once a building is uh, being constructed, it's removed from the build order. And uh, the only uh, runtime changes in the build order right now is adding a supply depot or pylons when it's needed. Uh, so you always have supply to build new units. Uh, except for Zerg, where I may have uh, the overlords, which is a unit instead of a supply building. And uh, one of the 
benefits of our system right now is that all this information is stored in files. So you don't have to go into and modify the code and uh, compile the system to completely change the tactics. So you have a list, uh, which is an order list of the uh, buildings to create. And you can have uh, one list for each uh, player-opponent combination. So the TVX file is the general Terran file. Uh, that is used if uh, the enemy is unknown or if you don't find a specific file. And you can also have one for Terran versus Protoss, Terran versus Zerg, and, and so on. So uh, at the startup of a bot, uh, this uh, file is, is read. Uh, the build order is uh, global. Uh, so uh, in the build order, you can put an, an expansion. So if you put into a, a nexus, uh, it starts an, an expansion. And uh, you can put into the nexus agent that as soon as I am created on a new area, I want to create some defenses. So the nexus agent itself can add some buildings that he wants to be constructed around him. But besides that, it's just uh, global. Ah, oh, there's a question online. Oh. I just see that now. Uh, what about the workers? Yep. yep. Uh, you don't have the, the units in the, in the build order file. Now I'm uh, getting into that in, uh, in just a second. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a second online question. Can you have several BOs, build orders, in the same series file? Uh, can you uh, clarify what you mean with uh, uh, several build orders in the same? Yeah, yeah, not at the moment. Uh, <coughs> what I want to, to do, but it's currently not implemented, is to have several versions of Terran versus Protoss, several versions of Terran versus Terran. And at the startup, you can uh, choose one of them, uh, either randomly or if you play against the same opponent, you can try with using Terran versus Terran 1. And if that doesn't work very well, you can try another and and learn which one is uh, working best. But as it is now, it's, uh, it's fixed. And uh, the build plan also uses uh, what we call a cover map. So it's uh, blocking the areas on uh, the game world that you cannot build on. So the red squares here is uh, blocked positions. So you are not allowed to construct a building on these. And uh, when we should find a new place to for a new building, we just search from a starting point, which usually is uh, the command center, and we search outwards and try to find the closest free position as possible. And in this case, uh, this worker decides to build a barrack. And uh, the found build spot is here. And once he has uh, decided to construct a building at this uh, area, uh, it gets a temporary block, which is this uh, green area. So. Uh, it's currently blocked, but if somehow this uh, worker is uh, killed or uh, for some other reasons the barracks couldn't be finished, uh, the block is released. If the barrack is uh, is finished, uh, it uh, will get a, a full lock, uh, have a red lock instead. And on the uh, some of the Terran buildings, like command centers and so on, you have the possibility of having add-ons. So. Uh, we block a larger area to the right of each of these Terran buildings. So we always have some free area for the add-ons. So we can specify exactly how big area each building shall block. So in this case uh, of the uh, command center, uh, you have one uh, tile free around it on each side. So uh, you can produce new buildings and uh, can move around it. But if you place a uh, supply depot like uh, here, you only block the positions that are currently that are taken up by the, the building. So you can build uh, the supply depots uh, next to each other. And if you you always start with a starting point where you place a building. So if you 
shall build a new barrack, you start with uh, uh, the base as the start point and you search outwards until you find a position. But if you want to build a barrack or a photon cannon or something, uh, you find the closest uh, choke point and uses that as a start position and tries to find the closest free position uh, around the choke point instead. So you can define uh, the choke points and change them. And at first I had uh, uh, each of the uh, buildings were responsible on their own for deciding if uh, we had uh, enough resources to, uh, to build stuff. Uh, or research or anything, but it turned out that it was uh, kind of a race condition between uh, uh, producing units, uh, doing research and so on, so I decided to to move all of these decisions into research manager, uh, which uh, can give a yes or no if uh, it's a good time to build a marine or if it's a good time to produce a barracks and so on. And, uh, it also have a research locks, which is quite important because when you decide to construct a building, uh, the resources are not uh, used up until you start to uh, construct a building, and it usually takes some time for a worker to move to the uh, position where he wants to build, construct a building, and, and start building it. So once you have decided to construct a building, you can lock up these resources so they are not used by anyone else. And it's also a possibility of adding some rules into a system. Uh, but uh, constructing a building should never uh, uh, reducing the total minerals below 150, for example. Uh, so you always have a small buffer to create units and so on. Uh, of course, it's uh, you can use some form of planner or much more intelligent uh, logic for this, but this is kind of a simple implementation that we use right now. And uh, as we wanted to, as I said a bit in the, in the beginning of the seminar, was that you can go into and modify or exchange the logic for different uh, uh, units, different agents at different levels of abstraction, so you can go into and micromanage marine, but you can also go in and create a, uh, a much better system for the resource manager, and and it will still work, because all these managers have an interface which uh, they are bound to use, and if you just follow that interface, uh, the rest of the system will work without changes. Upgrades and technology is uh, used in a list as well, and they are written on file. <coughs> it's the same as the build orders, so you can change uh, this as well in the files without recompiling anything. Uh, it can be a bit difficult, I realize, to uh, to understand in which order each technology or upgrade uh, becomes available because uh, they have to be created from a uh, building, and once the building is created, it might have some other requirements to actually do the upgrade. So you can upgrade Protoss Ground Weapons once level, but to upgrade it to the next level, you need to uh, construct another building, and, and so on. So instead, I decided to create this in three priority levels. So priority one is the one which you really want to be upgraded, priority two in the middle, and priority three is the last one. So you, the system will not do any text or upgrades in uh, priority level two uh, unless every uh, entry in priority level one is, is finished. So the order is not a single build order uh, that important. You can upgrade uh, leg enhancements before purchase ground weapons, whatever becomes available at first. And as before, you can have an, an upgrade uh, list from uh, for each player combination. Uh, for example, the uh, science facility vessel, which Terran has, uh, it can use the, uh, the ability to uh, disable Protoss shields 
which is basically only useful if you play against uh, Protoss, otherwise you don't have much use of it. So that was about the uh, managers. Uh, the combat managers is also a bit similar, and uh, I will return to your question about units. <coughs> the commander is uh, the... Uh, yeah, he's the boss of the, the whole... Uh, all the units we have. Uh, he takes all the high-level decisions like uh, launching attacks at uh, the enemy, when to launch them, uh, where to launch the attacks, and uh, if uh, a building or s workers or something is under attack, shall we order some squads to assist them, and how shall we defend our own bases, where should we place uh, defending squads and uh, defensive buildings, and so on. And it can also assign, if Terran assign workers to repair buildings and tanks. And this is currently rule-based. So uh, you can add different rules, and if a uh, condition is true, something happens. And this is also a, a possibility for uh, using different kind of uh, techniques to uh, build uh, different behaviors. Which is quite uh, simple. Uh, as yeah, they are hand coded. Okay. Uh, is there any, um, let's say, future aspect how, how to learn the rules, or did you take that into account um, as an experiment? Or, or yeah, yeah, the commander is one of the things that I uh, want to improve quite much in the future. Uh, for example, now it uh, cannot uh, launch counterattacks if. Uh, if a bot is attacked by the enemy and the enemy is repelled, it uh, should be able to launch an, uh, an attack back if it has enough uh, units alive and so on. That is currently not supported, but uh, it's easy to add things to a commander, and it would be very interesting to do some kind of automatic system to learn the rules or use some uh, machine learning tool or, or just create them from from some other knowledge than just my own experience from the game. And uh, back to your previous questions, uh, the commander is uh, handling all the units and squads, and they are as well written in uh, text files and read at the startup. So you define the uh, squads and what type of units to be part of the squads in these files, and uh, you can keep uh, different versions for Terran versus Protoss and Protoss versus Zerg and, and so on. And uh, we have a lot of different options here. We have different types of squads. Uh, offensive is just an ordinary attacking squad. We can also have rush squads as well. Uh, can have ground and air squads. Uh, Morphs too is used to if uh, we want to morph or change units into something else. Zerg have the possibility to to morph a lot of our units into different types, and also Protoss where you can uh, use uh, Templars to create Archons. So in this case, we have a, a Rust squad of uh, Hydralisks that uh, shall morph to Lurkers. So six hydralisks, and once they are created, they should morph to lurkers. The priority is uh, list <coughs> defines in which order each of the squads shall be filled with units. So a squad of priority level eight will always be uh, filled with units before uh, a squad with priority level nine or higher. And the active priority is uh, the priority that is used once a squad has been filled with units. So you can do a one-time squad. If you have a low priority, uh, it will be filled pretty fast with units, but if a squad is destroyed, it might not want to fill it again because you have a one-time rush squad, uh, like a Zerg rush or something, and then you can change to a very high priority. And if a prior active priority is 1,000 or more, it will never be filled with units. Offense type uh, required or optional uh, is uh, something the commander has. Uh, he decides to launch an attack 
at the enemy once all squads with uh, offense type required is filled with units. So that's his uh, quite simple rule about when to attack the enemy. And that could, of course, be changed to a much more interesting behavior. The commander is quite uh, it's quite weak part of the, uh, the bot as it is now. And setup is a list of the type of uh, units you want in, in the squad. So some of the benefits of using these text files is that uh, you can change stuff quite easily without recompiling. You can have different versions of squad setups and build orders and so on. And you can also have uh, people without uh, coding experience to, to change with uh, text files. And also you could think of a system where you uh, automatically generate these files based on some, uh, uh, yeah, either genetic algorithm or if you have a machine learning tool that uh, gets information from replays and stuff uh, like uh, research uh, Ben Weber and Michael Mateus have done where they created a database of, <coughs> of strategies uh, from uh, data mining replays. So you can use that database or, or similar to, to learn good build orders and stuff and and use them as well. The drawback as it is now is that it is a pretty static system. It doesn't change much. Uh, but I have some ideas about how to do that as well. In the setup file, squad setup file here, so you define a squad. So each of these start to end is uh, defining one squad. And this is handled by a squad agent, uh, which is uh, a commander has a number of squads, and each squad uh, has a number of, of units. So we use the command hierarchy in, in three levels. A uh, question here, is the commander responsible for sending the train commands to create units? <coughs> no, it currently isn't. <coughs> uh, the flow in the system is that once a structure agent that can create units, for example, a uh, barrack is idle, it uh, asks the uh, commander, uh, do you need a marine? And he can say yes or no. If he says yes, it asks the uh, uh, resource manager, do we have enough resources to create this marine? Uh, okay, we have, then train it. So each of the building agents is responsible for asking if uh, we want to, we want another marine in some squad, if we want to siege tank in some squad, and if he doesn't want anything, he, he doesn't train anything. <coughs> uh, the basic squad uh, agent is uh, having the most basic tasks. It can attack a position, defend a position. Uh, it can also be a support squad uh, sending uh, non-attacking units such as photos observers to different positions to uh, spot enemy cloaked units and, and so on. And of course we want to create, uh, sometimes want to create a more specific squad behavior and uh, to do that we can just create uh, special squads that uh, is extending the normal squad. So rush squad, uh, you can use a Sergra, circling rush or something similar. Uh, you can have a kite squad which uh, uses a hit and run tactic so it moves in, uh, fire a couple of rounds and retreat a bit and, and so on. You can also have uh, reaver drops, uh, where you can use a Protoss uh, shuttle to drop uh, reavers inside the enemy base, and so on. So you can uh, easily go in and write special logic for uh, a specific squad and use that. So uh, you can micromanage at both squad level and on unit level. And the exploration squad is also a special type of squad, which uses the exploration manager, which talked about earlier. And uh, also some notes on uh, navigation and pathfinding. <laughs> so 
some of you who might follow my research earlier knows that I'm a big fan of uh, potential fields, and I've been working with it quite a bit, <coughs> uh, which have its benefits and drawbacks. Uh, usually, it's pathfinding with A star, and uh, uh, Starcraft uses A star as standard if you use orders units to move to a certain position. And we use A star as well uh, when we are traveling over long distances, so we use a built in uh, system. So uh, you basically get this kind of behavior if you send a bunch of units to a different position, they move in a, a snake like way, so the fastest and most mobile units like uh, Marines tend to be in the front and the uh, siege tanks tend to be in the back and, and so on. So they move in this snake-like behavior. And, but once we are getting close to the enemy, uh, we switch over to use potential fields. And uh, the good thing here is that if we have two of our own units, the green ones here, they are to attack uh, the enemy unit here, we can define fields that are generated around these units. And uh, the fields, as we illustrate them here, have uh, lighter blue areas are the most attractive position. So if we generate the kind of field that have the highest uh, attracting position here, which is the uh, maximum shooting distance of our own units, uh, our own units will move in and place themselves here. So we can uh, fire the enemy at, uh, at the perfect distance. And since these fields are different depending on uh, the type of unit, uh, we can have siege tanks standing here, for example, because their, their fields are generated with maximum shooting distance here, and Marines can stand here. So our units tend to spread out around the enemy at the maximum shooting distance. And you can also uh, have a small uh, repelling field around our own units so they don't bump into each other, which will lead to that they actually spread out in a half circle at maximum shooting distance. And the dark areas here around the mountains is to avoid collision. So every interesting object in the game will have some form of field. And we sum up these fields to form the total field which we use for navigation. So once we are getting close to the enemy within uh, sight range, we switch to uh, using potential fields as navigation system. And you can see quite well from this screenshot here <coughs> that uh, the siege tanks here, my siege tanks, are uh, attacking an uh, enemy Zerg base. And here is uh, one of the Zerg bases, which the buildings which we are currently attacking. And all the siege tanks are spread out in a big half circle at maximum shooting distance to uh, fire at the base. So we have a potential field with the maximum, uh, the most attracting position around this blue line. And also, somewhere up, around up here, we will have some other Zerg unit or building or something that uh, this siege tank are currently seeing. So he uh, is attacking that one instead. And we probably have a field with uh, around here as well. So in this way, we get uh, the benefits from a uh, boat system uh, because uh, one of the drawbacks with potential fields is that you can get uh, stuck into uh, a local maxima. So you can get stuck behind uh, mountains, or you can get stuck in uh, if you have a U-shaped uh, dead end or something. But uh, that is usually, that problem is minimized if we just use potential fields when we are getting close to the enemy. And it seems to work fairly well. I see someone is typing, so I'm preparing for some questions. <coughs> yeah, Fairmont Rails is uh, one way of avoiding uh, local optima, uh, which means that you put a Fairmont pheromone like trail behind uh, the units where they are, have been visited at the 
positions we have been visited. Uh, so it pushes the units forward. Uh, it works fairly well, but uh, if we have very complex terrain, we we can solve it with Fermont rails, but uh, the thing is that potential fields is usually like uh, we realize that we are stuck into position and we use some form of technique like Fermont trails to get out of that. Uh, so it always takes some time to get out of the local uh, optima, even if we can get out of it. So if we combine the system with A star when we are moving over long distances, so we can avoid uh, terrain and uh, if we have a very narrow short ponds or if we have to move around a big uh, mountain or something, it uh, it goes faster to use A star because we get the perfect path instead of uh, maybe getting stuck and trying to solve it afterwards. <coughs> and one of the the benefit we want to get out of using potential fields is, of course, to uh, to attack in an efficient way to form these unit arcs around. Uh, the opponent's uh, units. So to uh, conclude, uh, I think we have uh, fulfilled the uh, goals that we wanted to fulfill uh, with uh, building a very flexible and expandable uh, architecture uh, for this bot, uh, where we can modify the logic at different levels. We can uh, use different kind of commanders. Uh, we can go into managers, like resource manager, to build a new resource manager, and therefore we can create a different kind of uh, behavior. Uh, the text files uh, are also easy to, m to modify, so we can try different uh, tactics as well. Uh, micromanagement of units, we can go into each specific unit to micromanage the abilities for that unit and uh, we can micromanage squads and, and so on. So I think the goal is uh, pretty much uh, met for the architecture and uh, one of the major things uh, I will be working on in the future is to make the system more uh, adaptable and uh, how that's I'm not sure where, how I will do that. Uh, one thing for sure is that we need some form of adaptive scripts, either to create uh, scripts using uh, a language, language where you can uh, write rules and stuff. You can use uh, Lua language or something like that, but I'm not very fond of, of doing that, really, because we don't need uh, a full script language to define this. Uh, I know there are some been some research about defining a language that can be used to define tactics, but uh, I haven't uh, read it yet, so I'm not sure. But there is something that I want to do. And I also have ideas about uh, splitting the build order up in several parts. So we have one part for the early game, uh, one or two parts for the mid game, one part for the end games, and these parts can be combined so we can have three early games. Uh, five middle games and two end games. You can combine this in, in different ways and you can either choose which parts to use uh, at startup or during runtime. So once your early build order is finished, you choose one of the middle build orders uh, with different properties and uh, once they are finished, you can choose an end game build order and so on. So that's also some ideas that I want to implement in the future. And of course, uh, it is realized, uh, released as open source. So uh, this is the website. It's on Google Code uh, with all the information about it. Uh, I uh, released a new version just a couple of days ago. There's also some uh, YouTube videos from uh, the bot uh, playing against uh, different opponents. <coughs> And uh, it is uh, free to use uh, for uh, students or projects or uh, whatever. Uh, I use it for some uh, master thesis uh, projects as well. And uh, I also used the system in my uh, game AI course for the students there. I worked in teams to create uh, tactics and stuff. 
and uh, we ended the course with a big uh, StarCraft tournament, uh, which was uh, very appreciated by the students. And uh, if you want to participate with something in the system, it's uh, always uh, nice to ever uh, get ideas or code for it. So I think that was uh, all I had to say. So any questions? <laughs> yeah, I have a knocking or uh, someone else wanted to use Ruby. Yeah, we surely have uh, some first thanks to Peter. Did you hear that? Or? Yeah, I have a knocking. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, yeah, maybe also at the, at the same time the online people. Yeah, you are of course free to uh, send me an email if there's anything you. I have a question. I have a question anyway. Um, what, what is not really clear to me now is, is how the resource manager and the commander are coordinated. I mean, these are probably the most um, most important parts of the system taking decisions because the resource manager has to plan uh, which resources to use for, for what task to, to upgrade, to build, or um, yeah, basically it's upgrading or building. But uh, um, the, the commander has to work with a given unit uh, once they are there, but and, and he's, he's Questioned by the buildings if he wants new units, um, but but how is this exactly coordinated? I mean, uh, does the resource manager have any plan, or does he just check with the rule uh, where we have enough units? So if the building is just asking, if the barracks building is just asking if uh, a new marine is needed and we have the resources, let's say. It's currently no plan, uh, uh, but it's uh, it would be very interesting to have. Uh, plan-based logic, which I plan in the future, but I haven't implemented anything yet. Uh, the commander has nothing to do with uh, deciding how to spend resources. He can just check how many of my squads are filled with units and ready to be used, and uh, if enough are uh, filled with units, uh, he can decide to do something. But resource manager is fully responsible for deciding uh, where to spend resources. And right now, you can only add some simple rules. For example, if you want to create a building that costs 300 minerals, and you only have 300 minerals, uh, currently only have 300 minerals, uh, you can say that it's not allowed, even if you uh, theoretically have the enough resources. He doesn't allow it uh, because he has a limit that uh, no uh, building should uh, reduce the number of resources below 150. So we always have some resources left to create new workers and to create uh, new units and stuff. So you just can enter simple rules in, in the resource manager as it is now. What happens, for instance, in a situation when you have uh, a squad, when the, the commander is waiting for a squad to be filled up, and only one of the more costly units is missing, so he doesn't do anything with the squad, I guess, because he's, he's just waiting for the last unit. And the resource manager uh, says, no, we can't build that now because I have to build this upgrade now. Uh, so he spends all the current resources on the upgrade, and the unit gets delayed. Uh, so the commander is still waiting, can't do anything. Uh, it's probably n not a very good game situation. I mean, um, you um, you give away an advantage. Yeah, that's uh, if, if you would use the. Uh, if we would that's one of the uh, major the weaknesses of the system as it is now, because the commander waits until he has all the uh, 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 units in his squad, and uh, the resource manager can, in practice. Uh, lead to that uh, these last units aren't created. Uh, usually it's not a problem because he uh, prioritized to uh, create units over doing upgrades and creating buildings. So that's an easy solution to his uh, situation, but of course it would be better if you have some form of planning so uh, the 
resource manager can uh, check the commander how many resources do you need do you are you in urgent need of some resources when I can give them to you instead of uh, giving them to upgrades and so on so that would be a more interesting system but it's currently not implemented would be also nice if you could coordinate that somehow I mean um, doing upgrades for example and uh, filling up the squad so that it can be used could be timed very well together if possible with the resources but I think it, it, can, it can be spent because uh, building the upgrade, for example, the, the, the ground attack one for the protoss takes some time. I think about two or three minutes in real time. And uh, the resource manager or the, or the commander also knows uh, how much time it will take to build all the other units. So they can start... Yeah, I think uh, to be ready uh, uh, to some form of shared uh, planning between the resource manager and the commander would be very interesting to, to implement. Uh, so you can get this behavior where they can uh, basically decide what's best to do currently. Should we fill the squad or should we create this upgrade so it's ready when the squad is ready and so on. It would be very interesting to implement. Uh, hopefully it will be implemented until next year's tournament. That is something that I have on my uh, wish list. Yeah, it, been working a year now on it, so uh, yeah, it takes time. Yeah, it always takes more time than than first thought. Yeah, it takes time. Uh, yes, I have a question about the uh, exploring, and uh, how far is the information which is gathered from the exploring integrated into the build order? For example, uh, you scout and you see your enemy is building air units. Will this have an effect? On the build, no, that's uh, also one part of the idea of making the system more adaptable. Uh, currently, it only gathers a lot of data, but we don't use the data for anything at the moment. Yeah, there are lots of weaknesses, but there's nothing that can't be fixed. <laughs> Yeah, you have a bot. Yeah, one of the yeah, goals, so. of course, was to, to create this bot to, uh, to be flexible and expandable. And, uh, of course, it's uh, okay for me to, uh, to use this as a basis and create uh, a different uh, behavior by using different commanders and stuff on it and, and use that in the tournament as well. I think that was one of uh, the... Uh, aid, uh, Organizes ideas as well with re releasing this code for all of these bots that uh, you, you shouldn't need to develop from scratch to just uh, get into the tournament. There should be something available which you can, in different ways, use. Mm. Yeah, of course, that's the main idea of the of the competition stuff uh, to to largen the number of people who are actually using or implementing bots and to yeah. and and to get some kind of um, comparison uh, so that people improve their bots because they know their weaknesses, I'm sure. Um, any more questions? Or? Um, the, the online people are also not typing anything at the moment, so I presume everybody is more or less happy. Uh, so many thanks again, uh, Johan, for giving this talk to us, although we, we are now no, only three in the room here, uh, could be more, but the semester is starting on next week and uh, Several people are currently in holidays. Yeah, <coughs> thanks for uh, letting me talk. Yeah, it's always I'm interesting to to share the work and see what the other guys can uh, can do with it. And, uh, of course, it will be a recording, uh, which you can send to people that are interested. And uh, uh, I will also be online in the chat for uh, a bit longer if there's some questions that arise. Yeah, that's great. Can you, okay, many thanks uh, again. Uh, can, you, can you somehow... Uh, yeah, it will, uh, once I uh, close down the meeting, it will uh, generate a link to uh, the replay and uh, I send that link to you.
Yeah, then I would say uh, let's officially close uh, this uh, first online seminar, as far as I know, in, uh, of the Chair 11. Um, uh, next week, semester will start, another presentation will go on that will probably have nothing to do with games. Yeah, same. Uh, um, thanks again,